for about, I don't know, man, two or three years, we have been bouncing schedules back and forth with our guest this morning, Dr. Mark, Mark Hosfeld. He's been to Gateway before, and we so look forward to him being back with, his, with us. And uh, everything just got in the way, Mark, of, of you coming. We were finally able to land this date. So last week, we focused on, on missions. This week, Mark is coming. He's the uh, vice president at Trinity Graduate School, past president of AGTS Seminary. Um, he and his wife are, are some of the uh, more well-known voices, I think, when it comes to understanding Islam. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, about an event tonight that you'll want to be sure and be a part of. But Mark's coming right now, and I'd like for you, would you just give him a great big gateway welcome, Mark? Thank you so much. Yeah. The gospel story, huh? Appreciate it. Yeah, the gospel that, story. That's what's all. Is your microphone on? It's going to be on. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back at Gateway. And COVID stood in the way the first time, and I'm not sure the second time. But here we are, the third time. The third time is the magic time. And I want to introduce this morning uh, someone who's never been to Gateway, but I've told her a lot about this wonderful church. And that's my wife, Linda Hosfeld. And... Linda will be sharing tonight at 4 o'clock during the dinner about Say Hello Serving Muslim Women, which is a very strategic mission from Assemblies of God World Missions to equip and mobilize women locally, and by that we mean the United States, and globally around the world on how to engage and reach Muslim women, because reaching Muslims is best done by gender, men going to men, women going to women, and it's important for us to know how to do that. Uh, just like the series that's coming up that's going to be teaching how to be able to engage people and share effectively the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Well, that's a missional effort, and that's what Say Hello does in equipping women to do the very same thing with Muslim women. So it's going to be a great afternoon with Linda sharing, and then the dinner, and then I'm going to be doing a Q&A this evening. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of our time together. And if you would, I'd like for you to stand to your feet. I'm a little bit of a traditionalist in some ways. And I'd like for you to open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. And we're going to look at chapter 2 of Colossians. And beginning at verse 6, when pastors Tom and Dave asked me uh, to preach this message uh, along this line of Islam and then also the world of secular humanism that we are steeped in in this country and many other parts of the West, I was praying and seeking God as to a passage of Scripture, and this came to me in study, and I think it's very appropriate for our time this morning. Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6 through 8. So Paul speaks to the church at Colossae, a city in what's now Turkey, and he said, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which demands, depends on human tradition and on the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Father, we ask this morning that you will give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Those that are in the traditional service and those that are watching online, we pray as you are the omnipresent God, you're ever present equally at the same time, that you will equally speak into our hearts and minds your truth that you would have us to know so that we can engage this world with the good news, the narrative of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it's in his strong name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are living in extraordinary times. As missionaries to Muslims, though I do work as a vice president at one of our Bible colleges in the Assemblies of God, we are also still very engaged in reaching Muslims, but we're also now working and reaching out to Buddhists and Hindus and secular humanists as well. And in the world of Islam, we're seeing Muslims come to faith in Jesus like never, ever before. As a matter of fact, the whole line of where Christianity is exploding it is no longer in the north and in the west, but it's moving south of the equator and it's moving east as well, back into Africa and to Asia also. And so these are tremendous times. 
when we minister to Muslims, we see that Muslims are beginning to embrace the true narrative about Jesus as we see in the scriptures, not what we read about Jesus in the Quran. And it's still true that as we see so many coming to faith, at the same time, we see that Christianity and radical Islam are still in a conflict with one another that will continue on throughout the 21st century all over the world, including the Western world as well. And it's still true that the goal of radical Islam is religious world domination. They too are an evangelistic faith like we in Christianity are a, an evangelistic faith. And so the eschatology of Allah, the end times of Allah, is for all the world to submit to Allah's revelation through Muhammad and to practice Sharia law as well. But yet, when we think about that issue, that narrative in the world, we also are dealing with another narrative at the same time in the United States that causes us great challenges. As a matter of fact, it's almost an inhibiting challenge to the church of Jesus Christ, and that's the narrative of secular humanism. Now, we may think that secular humanism is on the outside of us, but really, there is a, a cultural accommodation that is coming to the church through consumerism and through pragmatism and even narcissism and other secular ideologies that is trying to undercut us as the church of Jesus Christ. And so I've titled this message this morning, Who Gets to Narrate the World? Because there are three great narratives vying for the world's attention today. The fundamentalist Islamic narrative I mentioned. There is the secular humanistic narrative that we live in the midst of right now and we continue to live in the midst of. And then there is the Christian narrative. And let's call that God's narrative. And God's narrative is where we need to be living Yet the current challenge to the church and to us as members of the body of Christ is to recover the fullness of God's narrative and the vitality that it has upon the world in which we live. I had an interesting experience last night. We were at the hotel. I was sleeping. And in my dream, I kept having this verse of Scripture go through my mind that you probably know as well as I do. And it was from Mark chapter 12, uh, verses 10 and 11. And it simply says, Haven't you read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone, and the Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And that word capstone can be translated cornerstone as well. And I like cornerstone better. So I had this dream last night, and this kept reoccurring in my dream, just these words, like they were being said to me, and I was reading them. And then this morning when I had my personal devotions, and when I got to my New Testament reading, what did I read? But Mark chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, this very same passage of Scripture. And I thought, I don't believe this would just happen on this particular Sunday that I'm at Gateway Fellowship. I believe that God is really trying to reinforce something, that we as the church must rid ourselves of everything, everything where we have accommodated secular humanism in our lives that is diluting the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to be looking at our lives in a very particular way. And I think it's very important as you're going up to this new series on how to present the gospel, because when it comes to presenting the gospel, what is within us will be communicated to others. And so for us to be a people that are honed in the place that Christ would have us to be is very important, and that is Jesus being at the foundation, being at the cornerstone in every aspect of life. I love what Robert Weber writes. He says, in Jesus, God comes in human skin to reverse, to reverse the human condition and reconcile humanity to the Father. That's what Jesus is all about, and that's what we are to be communicating to this world that is without him, whether it's a world of radical Islam or a secular humanistic world that we are part and parcel of, because Jesus is the Godhead's narrative for the world. But we are in a battle, and it is a two-front battle, and it's not against people. I often say to people, I love the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. But there's also the great commandment. And if we are not living and practicing the great commandment, then we are hypocrites in communicating the great commission. 
And the great commandment is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And the radical Islamist is the radical Muslim is our neighbor, or the fundamental Muslim is our neighbor. But so is the secular humanist that may not believe in any way, shape, and form that we believe, but yet we love them, and that is the means of then communicating the great commission to them. And this war that we're in is not a flesh and blood war, but it is a spiritual war that is a two-front war that we have to fight at the same time. And God's narrative tells us that we will only become what we are meant to be when we fully submit ourselves to God's narrative. And so in every area of our life, in our thinking, in our words, in our actions, what we don't do, but also what we do, is to communicate the narrative of God because he is at that cornerstone. You see, when it comes to the gospel, our gospel is just not a redemptive gospel whereby we know for certain that if we die, we're going to heaven. And it's not merely, and this really fits into consumerism in the United States, that I will have this abundant life and all these good things will happen to me. Yes, there is that abundant life, John 10, 10, that God communicates to us that will be ours as we are in Christ. But we also suffer too. But there is that aspect of the gospel is that we are to also then to be prepared to share it with other people. Linda and I, we first started out in ministry on the south side of Chicago. We were the only Anglos in an all-African-American neighborhood in the heart of Chicago, and we were the only whites in this church of 700 people. And we were brought on staff there. I felt called to urban ministry, and that's where we were. I never forget, we had this one lady in the church named Thelma Luther. She was a school teacher. And one day after service, she came up to me and she said, Pastor Mark, just remember this. Heaven isn't just pie in the sky when you die, but it's steak on the plate while you wait. <laughs> and that's true. But that's a meal we need to be sharing with other people, right? And that's what this new series coming up is going to be all about. But our narrative includes not only that, but it also includes Christus Victor, that Jesus Christ is the victor. He conquers death. He conquers hell. He conquers the grave. And that was the message of the early church. And that's why they functioned so well in the world that is very similar to ours that the church began in. I love this quote by Abraham Kuyper, who was a Presbyterian statesman and the founder of Free University in Amsterdam. He said this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out, mine. Jesus claims it all. The state of Washington belongs to Jesus. He wants it all. The city of Seattle belongs to Jesus. He wants it all. And so does this beautiful town of Paulsbo. It belongs to Jesus. He wants it all. And so when we think about what Christ has done and what Christ is doing, he is wanting us not only to cherish the goodness of his salvation and what we have in and through him and the abundance that comes from that, but yet he wants us to have an over-the-horizon vision where we begin to see as he sees the world and he wants us to ready ourselves and to rid ourselves of any and all things that would hinder us from being the heralds he would have us to be. Perhaps some of you have heard about the revival that has been taking place at Asbury University and Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. That is a unique place. Uh, there is a history of revival at that university that's virtually generational since 1905. And I've been following it online. I have friends who I trust in their opinion and, and their deduction and their synopsis. And they went and they said, this really is a revival. This is a move of God. And we get excited about that word revival. But understand this. Revival is God pushing the fast forward button to get his people in a large setting to the place that he would have them to be anyway. It's getting to the place of being a normal Christian. I love the space program. I, as a kid, built every model, the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. I love what's happening with Artemis. We're going back to the moon. And if you watch a space launch from Cape Canaveral in Florida, 
you'll hear mission control at a certain point when that rocket is flying, going through different levels of speed to get into space, you'll hear someone at mission control will say, all systems are nominal. They're nominal. That's not a very exciting word, is it? But if you're riding on the top of that rocket, that means everything's functioning the way it's supposed to function. And that's why in the kingdom, revival brings us back to a place of being nominal. Sometimes you say, oh, he's a nominal Christian. He isn't serious. Really, that's a compliment if you actually understand the word because we're functioning the way that we're supposed to function. And I believe that God as the chief cornerstone, the one who wants us to not only fulfill the great commission, but then to live out that great commandment so that we really are loving him and loving people calls us into that. And when we live in the kind of world that we're living in, a challenging world in the United States where secular humanism and its ideologies and its values that are so counter scripture come against us, we have to say, well, where could we turn? And the place that we turn, of course, is back to God's narrative. Turn back to the scriptures and look at the church in the first century. Look at the church in the first three centuries. Do you know that we functioned and grew and we turned an empire upside down and we didn't have one church facility because we met in homes? But yet we were getting into every fabric of Greco-Roman society. And not only that, into Jewish society as well. Remember this when you read the Gospels and you read the book of Acts and the epistles of Paul, Peter, and John that the early church in the first century was birthed in a monotheistic fundamentalist context. Judaism at that time was finally doing what God wanted it to do, and that was to go into various places and to plant synagogues to spread the truth of God. And so when you find Jews in various places in the Greco-Roman world, and they're also spreading, they were spreading to the east as well, it's that they found, not because people were just moving to a different place to live, but they were actually going to plant synagogues to spread the truth of God. So that's why Paul had all these different synagogues to go to in the Greco-Roman world. But yet it was at its fundamentalist pitch of, of its highest order at that particular time. And so it was birthed in a context of violence against the narrative of Jesus, though he was the fulfillment of the very message that these missionaries going out to proclaim the truth were, were, were rebelling against. And so it was birthed in that context. It was birthed in the Greco-Roman world. And the Greco-Roman world was very much in values and ideology like our world today when it came to philosophies and political ideologies, and especially the area of sex. That'll wake some of you up right now. I'm really glad that the Lord is allowed to say that. Because right now, the greatest tension that we face is in the area of sex, identity, what a person can be, what they shouldn't be, and how much we should accept or tolerate or what we should reject. This was happening in the first century. So what kind of lives did these early Christians live? How did they function in a world with moral decadence, philosophical relativism, and religious pluralism? How did they live? We see it in the text of Scripture. And I believe God ordained it for them to live it out in such a way successfully and to grow the church so that we can turn back to the very same book and realize that we are not going through anything that any Christian at any age has not gone through themselves. They didn't have the technological advances that we have today, but when it comes to the moral values, they were facing the very same thing. And they, in that context, whether it was a religious fundamentalist context with Judaism or it was the secular humanism living itself out in the philosophies and the values of the Greco-Roman world, we see how they handled it according to Scripture, and the church thrived. The church grew because they kept God's narrative at the very center. And so Christians had to forge their moral narrative in the context of an immoral society, a society very much like our own, if not worse. The worst insult you could call somebody in the Greco-Roman world was to call him a Corinthian. It was a vulgar term to call him a Corinthian. Read the book of Corinthians and you'll find out why. So premarital sex between men and women was taken for granted. Adultery was commonplace, though frowned upon for women, but okay for men. Homosexuality was common and socially accepted. Sex was also a common expectation amongst certain religious cultic types of worship as well. 
But because at that age there were no universally accepted absolutes regarding marriage, abortion, adultery, or homosexual relations, sexual activity was regulated for the most part out of self-interest. That's the first century. That sounds pretty much like the 21st century to me as well. Because moral decadence, our fallenness in our nature, has not changed. It hasn't changed since the fall in Eden. And so the moral decadence of Rome was fertile soil. Think of our surroundings as fertile soil. For the counterculture vision of Christian values rooted in God's narrative, the scriptures. We are surrounded by fertile soil. I'm from the Midwest. My grandparents were farmers in Indiana. You could throw anything in that Indiana bottomland soil and it'll grow. Same with Illinois, same with Ohio. That's the kind of soil God wants the hard soil, the soil with the rocks and the soil with the tares to become the fresh, good soil so that the seed of the word of God can be planted and flourish and grow 30, 60, 100 fold. And that is as true for what's happening in Washington as it is for a place in Wilmore, Kentucky that's experiencing revival. This is God's narrative And so the point is that we must stop standing outside the narrative and judging it by human reason or any other kind of intellectual discipline. Such an approach makes God and God's narrative an object of investigation. We are to become the arbitrators of the truthfulness of God found in his narrative, the scriptures. So that means you and I need to stand inside the narrative. God is not an object within the narrative. We stand inside the narrative by faith. We stand under God, not over him, and we see the world through the narrative of what God's truth says, not the other way around. And that will be probably one of the most important things in your evangelistic preparation is that you speak from the narrative of God. You don't speak the truth of God from a worldly narrative because God's truth will be that which will penetrate Because there is no other inspired book in the world other than the Holy Scriptures that I hold in my hand and you hold in your hand as well. And so we must narrate the world. Let me share a story with you in conclusion. And it's a story that began in Colorado Springs. Linda and I were on vacation. We were visiting my daughter, son-in-law, and one of our grandchildren at that time. And as I dropped Linda off to get her hair cut, there was a coffee shop next to the salon. And I said, hey, that looks like a great place to go and because they had coffee and books. So I walked into the coffee shop, and this is how you can live out the very narrative I've been talking about, okay? I was totally unprepared for what I was about to go into. So I sat down with my computer, I got a cup of coffee, and as I sat there for about an hour, I realized I was the only man in this coffee shop. And I was the only male that had been a patron here. And so I got up to go wash my hands, Uh, to get another cup of coffee, and the sign on the bathroom door said, this restroom is for everyone. And I said, great, that solves the problem. My only thought was, should I put the toilet seat down or up? (laughs) So, as I'm standing there washing my hands, the Holy Spirit said to me, Mark, did you see the four women as you walked in to the restroom? And that time I was the president of the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. I said, yes, I did. And he said, I want you to go and talk to them. And I want you to ask them this question. This is what we're to do. This is the living out of the narrative, right? We go to them. We go to the harvest. The harvest doesn't come to us. We go to the harvest. Whether it's Islamic or secular humanistic, we go to the harvest. That's what Luke 10.2 says. Because it's ready, my friends. It is more ready than you think it is. And so the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to go to those women I want you to tell them that you are the president of a theologically conservative seminary in Springfield, Missouri. And I want you to say to them, if you could say anything you want to say to someone like me, what would you say? Now, when we lived in Pakistan, our home was five blocks from the Taliban embassy. I've walked by the Taliban. These guys with belts of ammunition, AK-47s. I never felt more intimidated than when the Lord asked me to go speak to those four women. I would have gladly gone up to a Taliban much more easily than these four women. I am am a lamb to the slaughter. These ladies are going to kill me. 
So, all right, you know, there's some things the Lord tells you to do. It's like, I don't want to do this. If I had my way, I wouldn't do it. But you're God. All right, I'll do it. You know, who am I to argue with you? And so I went out and I went up to the barista, and these three ladies were sitting at a coffee bar. They all were on stools, three on stools. And I said, hi, ladies. And they said, uh, hi. And I said, I have a question. And they said, what is it? I said, is this a lesbian coffee shop? Because for the last hour, I've been the only man in here, and I'm just wondering. And they started laughing. And I thought, here it goes. And I said, uh, is it? And they said, no, no. It's close. It's an LBGTQ coffee shop. I said, oh, I was just wondering, I, because I'm the only man that's been in here. And then I said, can I ask you another question? And they said, sure. And I said, I'm the president of a theologically conservative seminary in Springfield, Missouri. If you could say anything to someone like me, what would you say? And then the conversation started. And the first person who shared was a woman. Two of the women were in the military. And the other, one, other two, one was from a Catholic background, the other one was from a Presbyterian background. And the two in the military had no religious background whatsoever. And one of them started sharing. And when she started sharing, it was so rich. I was learning because I had started a conversation. I started hearing her narrative because I wanted an opportunity to share the narrative of God. And so she began sharing. I said, hey, this is so rich. Can I tape this? And she said, yes. And so I did. And out of that, I came up with some points that I want to share with you this morning. And uh, Dave, uh, Pastor Dave, is preparing a, a little article that I wrote about my experience that you can get tonight if you come. But here's the thing I found out in talking with them. Number one, and this was compassion without compromise. I didn't compromise the gospel in any way. But I learned this from them. Number one, Christians should not single out what they perceive to be an LBGTQ sin without fairly looking and dealing with their own sin in their life equally. Right? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Psalm 139. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So I have to deal with my own sin. I deal with my own cultural accommodation, my own privatism towards Christianity and my hidden sins. Right? I have to deal with myself first. That's what they're saying. And it was a truth statement. Number two, deal with the sin in your own life before you speak harshly about, she said harshly, they said harshly, about what you perceive to be LBGTQ sin. Number three, listen to us. And this is, I put in parentheses, each person felt that me being there that day and initiating the conversation was not only good, but they believed that God led me there to talk to them. You're going to be astonished at the conversations you have. And what people are really thinking. And then, number four, protect us from hateful speech and violence. They felt the attack on Orlando when about 50, approximately 50 people in the LBGTQ community were killed was not merely an Islamic extremist, which it was, but an attack on the LBGTQ community. And then lastly, number five, in essence, they all said, love us by words and actions. That's how we get a voice. That's how we do it. We're living out the great commandment first. We love God, his narrative, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We love our neighbor, no matter who they are. LBGTQ, fundamentalist Muslim, opinionated, ideologically centered, secular humanist. We love them. And that's what it's all about. And then we have the right to carry through with the great commission to go and to share the good news. So what did I learn from that spirit-led moment? First of all, we must love all people and not merely those in our faith fold because this is what Jesus did. Number two, we must be knowledgeable about the Bible, God's narrative, and how to apply it kindly and lovingly in conversations with people who do not hold the same presuppositions that we do with the Bible. Number three, we must be led by the Holy Spirit to be available to connect with people no matter who they are and what they believe, meaning God's narration. Number four, we must realize that the narratives in the world that do not agree with the Christian narrative will not be influenced and transformed unless we have dialogues that are respectful, kind, and honest with them. Do not pull back. Remember, Christus Victor, 
Speak God's narrative in love. Let the truth of God, let God speak for himself. Number five, as a church, we tend to tell, even shout our values when the world is looking for people of virtue. In essence, people full of the virtues of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As we are a people who are generally virtuous, the narrative of the gospel will be more readily heard than if we constantly declare our values. I mean, kind of bark them, shout them at people. Our virtuous life is real, intimate, and it speaks integrity. A values approach to people begins with relationship. And that's how Muslims are coming to faith today like never before in history. The number one reason they give, a relationship with a Christian. So that means you have to invest time. How will LBGTQ people come to Jesus? Through relationship. How will secular humanists come to Jesus? Through relationship. And then the word and the signs and wonders. And God will bring the rest of his narrative into play. Number six, you must realize Sunday morning is the believer's time to gather for discipleship, fellowship, and giving to the community of Christ. This is going to church like we're doing today. Number seven, disciples of Jesus must lovingly and respectfully engage people in the marketplace, even with individuals who believe and live narratives with which they don't agree. This is the way that Jesus touched and changed lives. Our time is up this morning, but I want to conclude by reading just a remainder passage of what it says in Colossians. Let's stand again, and then Pastor Tom will come. Listen to the beginning at verse 9 through 15. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ and forgave all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This, my friends, is our narrative. This is Christus Victor. Pastor Tom. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Shall we come on over here, Mark? So I'm going to ask you to pray, pray for us in just a moment. Can you do as we As we live out the gospel story and online and traditions, thank you so much for joining us today, of course, uh, in person. But we're going to continue this conversation this evening at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. in the Munger Chapel. So that'll be time for, for Q&A, right? Yes, absolutely. So no question is out of bounds. No, none whatsoever. Yeah. And so I'm really, really good. I remember when you uh, very first uh, time wrote about the experience in Colorado. And I think when we think about that, um, it's, it's, it's conviction, you know, and how we're living out this gospel story. And I think what you shared this morning is so powerful. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Okay, me too. Yeah, so bring your questions, right? No question is out of bounds. No question is too hard, right? That's right. Because if you can't answer it, your wife Linda will. Linda will answer it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Can, can, will you just pray for Absolutely. us as we do this? Would you? Father, I pray for this wonderful church. I love the name, Gateway Fellowship. That means a place of coming in to be received, but also a place of going out to bring influence. And I pray that not only will this place grow in the fellowship of believers, that will be nurtured and discipled as the men and women of God to touch and and change their lives to become more like Jesus. But Lord, then to be sent out through the Gateway to influence Paulsbo, this county, and this great state, And so, Lord, in Jesus' strong name, let us narrate your word, your truth. Lord, let us be the ones who share with the world the narration that you want the world to hear in this age of rivals. This we pray, and we pray with confidence knowing that you will bring fruit, for it's your word, it's your will. In Jesus' name, amen. And everyone said, amen. 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 Hey, make a friend as you leave. Thank you so much. See many of you tonight at 6 p.m.